and Ralph and those who have been praying in the background. Today we are moving on to chapter 26 of The Desire of Ages. Chapter 26, and it's at Kepanam. That's the title of, of that chapter. Before we start, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we come before your presence once again. We just want to thank you, Lord, for, for everything you are doing for us. We thank you for teaching us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who's there to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, and, um, yeah, to be our instructor in everything. Father, we continue to ask your Holy Spirit to guide us as we go into your, the spirit of prophecy, we are asking that the spirit which you inspired, Sister White, as she wrote these books, may that same spirit come and inspire each and every one of us on this group. Lord, that we will be able to share the truths which you have in store for us. And Lord, as we study your word together, may you sanctify us by your truth, Lord. May you change our stony hearts and may you Transform us. May you draw us closer and closer to you each and every day, Lord. May we not remain the same as we are studying about Jesus. Mm -hmm. May we have an encounter with our Lord Jesus and be changed by him, Lord. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit who will continue to work in our hearts and to draw us closer to you. Forgive us, Lord, where we have gone astray where we have said things which are not right. Lord, we are giving our hearts to you that you take these hearts, purify our thoughts. And Lord, may we be in one accord this morning as we study together. And may we have um, uh, a heart which is willing to be taught and to be transformed by you. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing us. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, this chapter in Kepanam, chapter 26, um, before we start, we go into the main reading. We are going to read uh, Luke 4, verse 31 to 43 and thank you um brother desire for sharing our reading sorry I, I i can't share myself but thank you so much for bringing it up um so it's kind of a continuation of chapter um, um chapter 24 and there are also bits from chapter 20 we will see. So this reading, Jesus had come to, to Capernaum. Um, remember, he had gone back from chapter, if we go back to chapter 24, um, Jesus had left Nazareth because they did not accept him. They they rejected him. This is when he read, remember when he stood in the church and when he went into the synagogue and he read from the, the prophecy, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61, whereby he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. That was uh, in Luke 4, verse 18. He had read that and, and he said to his uh, disciples, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. So what they had done um, when he was saying, uh, remember when he was also saying to them that, um, Many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, 
and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And they ate these things and were filled with wrath, the people in the synagogue. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city. This is, so we're carrying on from where we left from chapter 24, where he had to leave the city because the people in his own um country had rejected him uh, in Nazareth, in his own city had rejected him. And now he goes to, to Capernaum. So I don't know if I can help people reading uh, from verse 31, look for verse 31. And if we can read like three, four verses each uh, to verse 43. Anyone who's willing to read, I'll read the first four verses and someone can carry on. So it says, and it and came down. So it's kind of a continuation. It says from verse 30, I'll just start from verse 30. It says, but he passing through the midst of them went his way and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and told them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Someone can read from verse 35. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold mm -hmm. thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him into the midst, he came out of him, and hurt him not. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country, round about. And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was sitting, setting, all oh, they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. And he said, he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And devils also came out of many crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Yeah. Okay, I'll finish off. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. So this is kind of the, where this um, whole chapter is taken from. It's just covered the whole chapter. So um, can I have a reader to read the first two paragraphs, please? Oh, read. Shall we read? Shall we read? Go on, Go on. Thank you. Uh, just the first paragraph, yeah? Two paragraphs. Oh, two paragraphs. At Capernaum, Jesus dwelt in the intervals of his journeys to and fro, and they came to be known as his own city. It was 
on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and near the borders of the beautiful plain of Genesaret, if not actually upon it. The deep depression of the lake gives to the plain that skirts its shores the genial climate of the south. Here in the days of Christ flourished the palm tree and the olive. Here were orchards and vineyards, green fields and brightly blooming flowers in rich luxuriance, all watered by living streams bursting from the cliffs. The shores of the lake and the hills that at a little distance encircle it were dotted with towns and villages. The lake was covered with fishing boats. Everywhere was the stare of busy, active life. Mm. Right. For the reading, yeah, is we have heard is saying that Jesus rode in the intervals of his journeys to and fro, and it came to be known as his own city. It looks like he had a better, um, he was accepted in this city because it says he, he, it became known as his own city. And they are just describing how beautiful the city was, the nature, how breathtaking, just the when you were reading, it looks like the nature was just breathtaking. And you know, it's it's just amazing when you live in such a lovely place where it's the green trees, the living streams bursting from the cliffs. It's really a nice scenery just to listen to this. I don't know if anyone has good comments about the first two paragraphs. If you just read, um, anyone who wants to comment on that? Yes, prayer retreat. I think Brother Desire is it. Go ahead, mm -hmm. prayer retreat. Oh, it's Sister Casey. Okay. It's, it's Sister Casey. Sorry. Thank you, Sister Judith, for that. Yes, I there's something about nature. Um I it it just relaxes you. I'm thinking, you know, when we when we went to Romania uh in the camp meeting. Uh, the stream around the mountains, the tranquility around the place. Uh, this is why God is keen for us to live in the countryside, because there's something about nature which um, which gets to us, which makes us alive again. We we are brought more to um, our our natural being, you know. It's it, it, you know when when um when people are very sick they'll say take them away from the city and let them stay in the in the countryside and they get better because God you know natural things of God when you sleep at night there's no light to disturb you when you you know there's no cars there there's nothing you know artificial noises the noises which you hear are the birds of singing birds, the animals, you know, a, it was very lovely for to hear, you know, the moo of the cows and so forth, you know, for a change. It just makes your heart glad. And to think Jesus was in this surroundings. Remember, Jesus is the creator. Mm. And he was amongst this, uh, admiring the work of his creation. And, mm -hmm. and and benefiting from his own creation and saying I've given this all this to 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 my people what a lovely what, what a lovely uh, setting you know a uh, sister white is describing here thank you so much yes thank you sister Casey thank you um sister Dorothy go ahead please 
morning. Morning, Sister Judith. Good morning, everyone. And Sister Casey, I was speaking there about the nature and, you know, this beautiful nature and how, you know, we were not actually meant to live in these polluted cities. Mm. And I was just thinking, here Christ comes to Capernaum and, the you know, he talks about this lake which gives plain the skirts of his shores, you know, and all of these, the orchards, the vineyards, and all of that. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ was the true, pure water of life. Okay. And although the nature is beautiful, Jesus desired to give these people of Cap Capernaum to reveal the, himself to them and who he was. And I believe great works were done in Capernaum, you know, <clears throat> And and Jesus being the water of life, so he must have been looking at the beauty there and and longing to give them that water of life. They had all this water, all these things, but he knew that many were thirsty and thirsting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for their souls to be uh, to to be um uh, what do you call it to be um to be quenched of the thirst of the soul. It's just so rich. And uh, it's amazing how Jesus calls himself, um, it, it, you know, the water of life, you know, yeah. and how he invites, he invites people to come and drink freely the water of life. Yeah. It's amazing how Jesus draws these crowds to himself, they may have all these wonderful things, but one thing, one focus that Jesus has is he's focused on giving them the water of life so that they may also carry out this water to others. They may become also streams of that living water to give it to the other nations. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. You really described, both of you, the beauty in this place, the nature, the lovely, you know, nature in this place. I don't know if there's anyone else who has something to, to say on the two paragraphs. Otherwise, we'll continue our reading. Okay. Can I have someone else to read the next two paragraphs, please? Capernaum itself was well adapted to, the to be the centre of the Saviour's work. Being on the highway from Damascus to Jerusalem and Egypt and to the Mediterranean Sea, it was a great thoroughfare of travel. People from many lands passed through the city or tarried for rest in their journeys to and fro. Here Jesus could meet all nations and all ranks, the rich and the great as well as the poor and the lonely. His lesson would be carried his lessons would be carried to other countries and into many households. Investigation of the prophecies would thus be excited attend thus be I'll read that again. Investigation of the prophecies would thus be excited. Attention would be directed to the Saviour and his mission would be brought before the world. Notwithstanding the action of the Sanhedrin against Jesus, the people eagerly awaited the development of his mission. All heaven was stirred with interest. Angels were preparing the way for his ministry, moving upon the hearts of men and drawing them to the Saviour. Thank you, thank you for the reading, beautiful sisters. Um, yeah, so it looks like Capernaum, Capernaum, I think, yeah, that's how you say it, isn't it? Capernaum, where it was situated, it was the best place because it says it was on the highway from Damascus to Jerusalem and Egypt and to the Mediterranean Sea. It was like a hub, isn't it? Where 
um, a lot, you know, other, it was like way many um, people would meet. It was a great thoroughfare of travel. People from many lands passed through the city. So it was just the best place where the, you know, Jesus, our message will be carried to other um, countries, to other places. And it says Jesus could meet all nations and all ranks, the rich and great, as well as the poor and the lowly. And his lessons will be carried to other countries, into many households. So this was a, a perfect center for all these things to happen and people were being awakened you know it says here the angels were even preparing the way for his ministry moving upon men's hearts the angels has always been moving in people's hearts even into this into our day today the angels they have that work and the holy spirit is constantly working um, for us, to us, and so that Lord, we will be accepting the word of God. Brother Desai, go on. Amen, amen. Um, yes, in fact, I just wanted to, to add to those thoughts. Good morning, good morning, by the way. I say you did good morning, everybody. Now, um, I think... Um, here we we are getting an idea of um, the location of um, of this city, Capernaum, and um, you know Jesus was intentional. Uh, it's very important to note this that uh, as as you rightly described there, uh, what it says that um, this city was. Uh, strategically positioned for evangelism. Um, it says it was on the highway from Damascus to Jerusalem. So if you understand, Damascus was the capital of Assyria or Syria now. It was Assyria then. Um, that's where Paul was journeying to from Jerusalem to Damascus. So that means he had to pass through Capernaum. Uh, it was on the highway. Now, so you have two important uh, 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 places here. You have Jerusalem, capital of Israel, Damascus, capital of Assyria. So Damascus was on the north. Jerusalem was uh, more in the middle. And then Egypt was on the south. And it also speaks of the Mediterranean Sea. So Indeed, uh, she says that it was a great thoroughfare of travel. People from many lands passed through the city or tarried for rest in their journeys to and fro. Um, now, it's interesting, actually, that uh, I was looking from um, Wikipedia. Um, I was just searching Capernaum, and uh, it does that also that it's interesting uh, the, the the historians there they they've done their research as well and they confirm that this was the second home of our Lord. Uh, Nazareth was where he was brought up, his first home. But Capernaum, it was his second home. And here, great miracles. I I guess uh, uh, we're going to learn more about what was done in Capernaum. But the fact that um, it was so strategically positioned geographically, um, Jesus intentionally uh, decided to make this city a second home so that his work uh, will have uh, a far-reaching effect. Uh, as it was saying, um, I think it was towards the uh, 
the last part of the first paragraph. Um, yes, his lessons will be carried to other countries and into many households. So, so I was just thinking, yes, this was also uh, in fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, I haven't seen the prophecy yet. I'm, I'm looking for the text. It must be a text somewhere in Nahum, uh, Prophet Nahum, where he was prophesying uh, that um, Capernaum was going to be an important city in the mission of Christ. Uh, interesting also to note that in Matthew 4, verse 13, it says, In leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. So Jesus left Nazareth and came and dwelt in Capernaum. It says, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali. Um, so the two tribes of uh, Israel there, Zebulun and uh, Naphtali. Um, so, so Nahum, Prophet Nahum, had prophesied something along these lines. If somebody finds the verse. Uh, please uh, do share. But yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, we have to be intentional. You know, when we do God's work, we have to be intentional. Whether we are doing uh, evangelism, we're giving out literature, or we're doing soup ministry. You know, when you're going out there to give books, you need to look for a strategic position. Maybe uh, somewhere, you know, where you can catch a lot of people, you know, it's not just about, you know, giving out books, but, you know, we have to think wisely. I mean, to be wise uh, 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 when doing mission, just like our Lord was wise in placing himself where he was going to, to reach out to many. Amen. Are you muted, Sister Jaden? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you about that. Thank you, Brother Desire, for those powerful words. It's it's true. We have to be this was intentional in it. Do we even when we can see that there are more people coming who will be able to accept our work, uh, the work of God. Yeah, Sister Dorothy, may you also go ahead and share your thoughts. Yeah, you know, when um, uh, Sam was speaking there, he said we have to be intentional. Jesus Christ was intentional in Capernaum. He uh, identified this city and it was like the capital city of his mission because he knew that these rich and the poor you know, when they come here and they take the word, the lessons that he had taught there, they will be carried, you know, to other parts of, or, 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 of the world. It's a mission to the cities. So when we, um, when we go to these cities uh, in our mission also, we should be intentional and ask God to guide us so that we can position ourselves in the best, you know, in the best places. She even emphasizes about, about our literature, how we should target big gatherings. And there are many ministries who are doing that, and especially loud cry ministries. They target, uh, you know, gatherings where there are protests and any other kind of large gatherings. And they they, scatter, they give literature. They are like the leaves of autumn. And this is a message for us today. So Jesus is our example. He's not afraid to go to Capernaum and, and go there repeatedly, many, many times. He doesn't just go once, but he makes it his capital because he knows different people are going to be coming to that city, you know, every day. And he makes it his mission to bring the light here so that others who are coming in and going out they can carry this torch of of the light of Christ to the mm. to the to um to the outside of Capernaum and then 
other towns and cities will be lighted and other nations may come to know the, the truth uh, through him. So when you and I are doing um, literature evangelism in, this, in these cities, imagine some of them, they are visitors, they are tourists. And when we go to crowded big cities and we give these books, you have no idea who they are and where, how far they are going to take this gospel. You know, it's going to be very interesting. We are going to get so excited when Jesus comes and and we see the people who will be in the kingdom because you, you know, one person who was even a, a visitor in the city where you and I were working, went read that book, and then he gave the light to another, and then the kingdom of God is growing bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, we should um, we should focus our interest on the gospel of Jesus Christ because what we cannot see is so exciting. By faith, I can see it just with my sinful vision. You know, I can see how, how God will actually allow us to see what you and I did. You know, all the sacrifices that you and I did. When you went and stood there, when it was rainy, when it was cold and winter time, when you, uh, you know, instead of using money to yourself, you gave it to the cause of the gospel. And you will see what influence that your, your love for the Savior has done for the souls of men who are perishing. So may we have the spirit of mission to the cities and target these cities and go. Just go, Jesus is going before, is already gone before us. The angels are there. The Holy Spirit is there. The uh, heaven is interested in preaching the three angels' messages, the everlasting mm -hmm. gospel. So we should, we should really feel honored by Christ to give us this amazing work. There is no other job in the world better than being a servant of Christ. Thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. Powerful thoughts there, which you've shared. You know, um, I'm just I was just looking at this paragraph which says, um, notwithstanding the action of the Sanhedrin against Jesus, the people eagerly wait awaited the development of his mission. And I'm just thinking the times we are living now. We know Jesus is about to come. I am, um, you know, we shouldn't this be how we should be, you know, the same way these people were. We're eagerly awaiting for the development of his mission. We can see things are being fulfilled so rapidly. And we have work to do the mission to go and and spread the three angels message to the people out there and you know these people were really looking forward to to hear from Jesus and we should be really looking forward to the, uh, for the second coming of Jesus yeah that is just the thought which came to my mind sister Arlene please go ahead and share thank you good morning good morning all uh, is so true you know the gospel is going out um and it's going out to places that we cannot reach um we've got the airways we've got tv we've got the media you know they put all of these places these things in places um for for bad but you know the lord's message is going out there somewhere and we have to um Thank God that it's going to places that we cannot go because I've seen, um, you know, like um, the bachelor going to these places that um, they haven't got a roof over their head, but they've all got a mobile phone and they're listening to amazing facts. They're listening to, um, you know, all these 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 good these good things that is going out the three angels message and they know th they know the Bible. They haven't got a Bible, but they know it because it's been preached in, in, in all the world for a witness. And, you know, they all they are hearing it. 
and it's bringing you know the the, the airways is um it is therefore bad it it, it does it, it it sends out wrong messages but there's also good messages too so you know people are listening and people are hearing and if we can't go it is going out thank you amen amen, amen. thank amen. you amen. Amen. That's true. Um, we have Brother Desire again. Would you like to share your thoughts once more? Yes. Uh, interesting thoughts being shared. And I just wanted to 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 just share this uh these thoughts. Uh, I was just thinking in terms of ministry. You know, uh, people who do marketing. Um, they understand uh, they have uh, uh, a subject they call strategic or strategic strategic uh, marketing you have to to have a strategy of uh, getting your message out or of getting your products known or your services known you have to make people aware of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Jesus might not have uh, 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 all the resources, worldly resources, but he had spiritual resources. But nonetheless, he had the wisdom to put himself in a place where the message was going to get home to the remote parts of uh, of uh, of the day. I was thinking uh, in our ministry, you know, it's sad that uh, when it comes to God's work, uh, we don't put as much effort as the worldlings do in their in their endeavors. Sure. I mean, see, when you're going into these big cities, you know, banners are put on strategic positions, you know, where cars are going through into the city where you can't not look at it. It's displayed right there. And there's adverts flashing, flashing. I wonder if it was possible for a ministry doing such an important work, preparing souls to meet the Lord, to put a banner you know, in some cities, just as advertise, uh, telling people um, about the king who is coming again. So true. Jesus is coming again. Or inviting people to things like these Bible studies to prepare for the, for the king. I wonder if it's possible to do that. Or if God's people uh, 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 would be happy to think big in terms of um, uh, uh, putting more strategies to 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 let the world um, know of what's happening. Uh, you know, because I'm sure we have more resources. Um, and as much as we pray, we also have. You know, Jesus was prayerful, prayerful man, but he had to relocate from Nazareth to Capeno. Mm -hmm. What are we doing as a ministry or as individuals? Or sometimes we're just satisfied that, you know, somebody else will do it. Uh, maybe gospel, uh, wow. what is called amazing facts, will do it. Or... I don't know, Hope Channel who do it. It's just a thought that was coming to my mind that, uh, yeah, there's more that God expects of us, I believe. So true, Brother Desire. It looks like we kind of limiting God because if we were to go by your ideas, what you are saying, putting banners, because this is an urgent message. The time is short now, but yeah, it's 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 really thought provoking. What can we do? 
to make it really big. Suppose we we kind of limiting or maybe um our faith hasn't gone to that stage where we take that boldness to just you know find out how we can even you know put banners and just make people know that we don't have time anymore Jesus is coming and also when we are doing this evangelism work or even distributing the books how are we presenting ourselves our, our faces are they showing the excitement the agency of the things which the books which we are sharing with others that look people you need to take this how how are we presenting ourselves because sometimes we can be there and we are just looking so sad and people are not going to take so many of our books because we, we don't have the enthusiasm i'm not saying we we don't but I'm just saying if we are not having that enthusiasm and showing it on our faces that, hey, we've got an agent message here. Come and see. Come and take what we have. Yeah. It's, um, I don't know, prayer retreat? There's someone prayer retreat who's raising yeah, hand. Yeah, it's, it's me, Sister Sharon. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I'm going to go off at a tangent, forgive me, but as I'm listening to what's going on, this is triggering me. My question is, so we, we get the impression when Christ started his ministry, he was very much focused in working in the, the neighbouring areas, also t attending the synagogue. But we get this idea here now that his attention now is on evangelism and mission. We don't see so much activity in the synagogue, but more outside the synagogue. Also that they have, for this ministry, they have their own financial support because we, we get the impression that um, Judas is the person that is holding the funds. So what I am seeing is a ministry independent of the, of the synagogue. Um, a lot of the work is done outside the synagogue and it is funded. My question is then, is that not, if we are um, patterning our, our, our walk with Christ, is, not that the, is that not the journey that we should be going through as God's people, where we are not so much focused centrally of being physically in the church, but going out and also having funding separate from the church to do this mission? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, anyone who wants to answer, I can see that Brother Desire, your hand is, is up. Oh, sorry, that was the last hand. Um, I, I missed the question. I didn't quite get the question, by the way. Okay, Sister Sharon, do you want to just repeat? I think you were talking. I think I'll let you. I, I suppose, say. yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's not, it's not so much a question. Yes, there was a question at the end. So my yeah. statement was, from what we can see, at the beginning of um, Jesus' ministry, it was very focused around the synagogue. Um, yes, it was and very close to home. But we get the impression that now the ministry is very driven we don't see so much visitation to the synagogue because the focus is evangelism and mission and that they have an independent financial um, funding for this ministry, which is independent from the, um, the, the synagogue. So if we are God's disciples, should we not be patterning our ministry on what he did in order to get the work done. So that's my question. 
I don't know if um the brother desire or oh, sister Dorothy, you've got your hand up. Okay. Wanna... Please go before me. <laughs> brother oh, can desire? I go? Yes. Okay. Well, um, that's a good question, Sister Sharon. And uh, we thank God that we're already doing that. We have our uh, self-supporting fund. This is why we we encourage the brethren, you know, when they are moved, maybe to make regular donations uh, to support the work, the cause. Uh, we are not asking money from our... Uh, 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 the church budget uh, to do the work that we have. Um, so Jesus, you would say, yeah, the self-supporting ministry. Um, uh, and this is precisely how uh, uh, most self-supporting ministry are, are designed. Because you don't want to get involved in um, the budgets of the regular lines because then there's too much paperwork, there's too much admin that those monies have to go through. Um, Jesus said the self-supporting ministry. I mean, he had a powerful ministry. John the Baptist said the self-supporting ministry. Uh, the, 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 the church was running their day-to-day -day business, um, admin work, but uh, so, so, um, to 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 say in few words, um, uh, praise God that we have uh, our account as a ministry, and uh, it's just if the, the the if God's people were 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 moved to do more, I think if we were moved to do more and support the 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 the, the, the funding of the uh, of the ministry. I think there's great opportunities before us. We can do um, many things for the Lord, many exploits for the Lord, um, because we are not tied um, uh, with the budgets of the of of the church. Okay, thank you, Brother Desai. Uh, Sister Dorothy, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. You know, Sister Sharon, that's a really important question because I think it's up to the individual to uh, to uh, to decide what they want to do. You see, during the time of Ellen White, there were there was regular and irregular lines, and how much more should there be more irregular lines working for Christ? Because the work is more needed than ever. Finances are needed. So I'm not actually uh, trying to answer your question because it's a very big question and I don't have an answer for it. I'm just saying what I am thinking uh, based on what your question. And uh, I personally believe that if we wait for the whole church to be revived and to go out and do the work, <laughs> we will, I think, you know, we will wait for a very long time. So we cannot afford now to delay this work, waiting for some elder or some pastor in our churches to, uh, you know, to encourage the members to go out with the work. There is a need for irregular lines now more than there was during the time of Ellen G. White. That's my, my, my thought on that. And we should ask God to give us wisdom how to do it. I personally do not believe that if, according to what she wrote, the people who are doing work as irregular, self-supporting, they should be supported by the funds from the conference. But it is not so. Now, people who are self-supporting, they are seen now as the as as people as they feel threatened. And once they know that you are working outside the church, you become an enemy of the church. You are even an, an offshoot, 
I'm sure most of you have got that experience. So what can you do to further the work? As for me, it is just simple, self-supporting work. And two people of the same mind, and as Sun Desire said, and have a fund where there is money coming in to support the work. We must do that. There is no time. Time is running out. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. Yeah, thank you. Um, Brother Tena, would you like to make your comments? Yeah, good morning. Morning. If, if, you, if you look at eh, the purpose of the books in the first place, um, why Ellen White wrote these books, it was for the purpose of preparing people for the coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it is not a, a coincidence that we are going through these readings. And I don't believe that we are just reading for information. Mm -hmm. I believe that God is inspiring his people to do what Jesus did. And the fact that um, Jesus had a treasury, I believe that you know we can also pattern that by having our own funds to fund the work. Because as Sister Dorothy says, if the church is not doing it, because if the church wasn't doing this work during the time of Christ, and so he formed his group and went out to minister. So I believe that the Spirit of God is speaking to us and is saying to us that this is what we need to do also. Not just to read for the information, but to be inspired mm -hmm. to go out and finish this work. Amen. 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 Powerful. Thank you, Brother Taylor. Sister Kay, Sister Casey. Thank you, Sister Judith. Just following on, um, I'm just going to say it as it is. Uh, following on from Sister Sharon's question. Uh, I've posed this question uh, before, again, I think, to um, self-supporting ministries as well, to say, is it wrong to retain our tithes and offering in self-supporting ministry to do the work of God? I know this is a very sensitive area. I haven't had any sort of like um, clear answer. I've been trying to dig in Sister White's writing, writings. Um, is it wrong for using our tithes and offerings to support self-supporting mm -hmm. ministries to further the work of God? Thank you. Thank you, Sister Kezia, for your question. I think a lot of us who might be also having those thoughts. Um, but I just wanted, actually, before Sister Dorothy can comment, just wanted to say quickly, you know, um, um, I can't remember, I haven't actually looked the, the verse which I wanted to quote, whereby that woman who just had and who came to give offering in the church and the Pharisees, many people were coming in Jesus' time, were coming and putting, you know, big money and she only had just one coin to put in and that was all she had. And I'm just thinking, she brought it in that church which was so corrupt, but she brought an offering in, in, in that corrupt church. So something to think about. <laughs> Sister Dorothy, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think this question has come up before, even when we held Elder Chitate before, and it's been going on. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to every one of us because why does this question keep on coming up and coming up? And why do so many people now are coming up wondering, what shall we do? And I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you individually. You pray. When the time comes for tithe, you pray because I want to ask you here, all of you, how many people earn, how many people earn so much money 
that you can afford to return the tithes to the conference churches and at the same time put a generous amount of money towards God's work. How many of us here? <laughs> How many? Well, here is the Holy Spirit, I believe, is going to be our guide. You pray. What, what we don't want to do, we don't want to be um, influencing church members in our churches or asking them to return their ties to your self-supporting ministry. You don't want to do that because you're going to cause a conflict between yourself and the conference. So your tithe and my tithe is mine, is, is God's, and I've worked for it, and I am working out my salvation. So God will show me what to do with my tithes. I will pray, I say no. So when we pray, each person, God will show you. Amen. But whether you are willing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, that is your choice. Because if you allow fear to drive you, you will not do anything. You will continue knowing that this money is not going to be used for the ministry. You know, the church is not moving with the message. And you're going to be so scared because they have decided the conference is the storehouse. As for me, yeah. I am publicly confessing that I do not believe that the conference is the only storehouse. I don't believe that. Why? Because mean? God's work is suffering. We have to give out the message and we cannot wait until the whole church is revived and going out with the three angels' messages. So for me, if there is an active established ministry that is doing the work, I am going to be praying to God to show me where to direct my tithes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Dorothy. Sister Dorcas, please go ahead. Thank you, Sister Judith. Uh, morning, everyone. I just want to say what I think. I don't say it's right, but I think if God had already told us to pay our tithe to the church, we should pay our tithe direct to the church. And we have more which we have left with us. If we take our 10%, or 20%, we remain with 80%. And this 80%, we can divide it for whatever things we want to, to use it for. It's like he, that man who went to Jesus, and Jesus told him that you should sell, that rich man who went to Jesus, and he was told to sell what he have and share to the people who were in need, and he was very angry. He went away because Jesus had touched the way his heart was. I think the same applies with us. If God has told us to pay that tithe, God knows that his servants, the ministers, they need to survive. So they need to survive from our pockets, from that 10%. So we mustn't say, because there is another uh, one, I'm going to give that 10% and not give the, the church the 10%. I think if we do that, we are wrong. But if we want to give, we can give the 10% which we are supposed to give to the church, then the rest, we can decide whatever we want to do. We can pray to God and God will, will tell us whatever to do. This is okay. God's command it's not a, any human being is command it's not the pastor who said you must you bring your sent to me it was the it was god who said we must bring it to the church and the israelites they were told that the levites they were not going to have fields but the other people were going to have fields and bring whatever they get from the fields and support the levites so the Levites, their work is to spread the word of God. Whether they spread it or whether they don't spread it, it's not our our party to judge them. It's God is a 
we did the party. So we do our part to give whatever we have been told to give to the church. And the rest, we can do whatever we want to do with it. Thank you, Sister Tokas. Yeah, our time is running out, but to have Brother Tina, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll just be as quick as possible. Um, I think that if if we truly believe that the Seventh Day Adventist Church is God's God's church, is still God's church, and we are members of that church. I think we have a duty to support it. Mm. And the Bible specify how we are to support it. Now, the, the tithes belongs to God. So if you're a true Christian, you're going to pay your tithes. Mm. So I believe then that the real sacrifice is in the offerings that we give. Because if the tithes is already set aside for God, what you give from your offering is where the sacrifice comes in. Mm-hmm. So if we're saying that um, we are to, to have a self-supporting ministry to finish the work, then it's going to take a sacrifice to do that, which mm-hmm. is your offering. So set aside the, the tithes apart, which God says, pay to the storehouse. Because back in the time of Christ, the synagogues and the um the temple needed to be sustained. They needed repair. They needed to be maintained. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe Jesus discouraged the members to pay whatever was required. But somehow God blessed them to provide money for his ministry as well. So, you know, my take on it, the, 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 the question that Sister Sharon asked should be the main focus right now. And then, you know, if we are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we need to sustain the institution until probation close. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I suppose, Sister Ruby, you, you could start tomorrow with your comments. Thank you for those comments which everyone has brought uh, in this. Um, can I ask um, Sister... Sister Dorothy, can you pray for us to close? Yes. Dear Merciful Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the study that we have had this morning. We have seen how you went to Capernaum and you made it. You made so many regular visits to this city. And you are teaching us that we are to bring the light that you have given us as your remnant church to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So may you open a way for us that we may be light bearers, that we may say Jesus is coming again, and we may not be ashamed of the gospel. Can you show us, please, dear Lord, how to work for you? As it was being said here, shall we have posters? Shall we be bold? Shall we be able to um, to put these posters that Jesus is coming again? What shall we do, Lord? Do not receive the mark of the beast. What shall we do? Do we need to be loud or do we need to quietly place the quiet silent witness of the three angels' messages at people's doors and out in the public places. Surely, Lord, you want this work to go forward. And we just pray that you will speak to each and every member of your church. May you speak to the people at the conference, from the conference level in leadership, that they may understand the urgency of the message that you've given us as a remnant church. Because of frustration, most ministries are being, uh, are, um, they have gone to self-support themselves. And most, most of us, we are thinking as we were discussing here, maybe we should pray and ask you to direct us to give the tithes to the irregular lines. Lord, 
it's your money. We are concerned that there is nothing happening in the mainstream churches. So Lord, we pray that you give us the wisdom as we pray that you may direct us so that we do not um, we do not forget that this is your church and the ministers, the same ministers who are sleeping and are not encouraging members to go forward with the messages, that you may awake them and the elders as well, that they may put you first. May you be the one to direct us because it's not our desire that there should be no money in the storehouse to pay the ministers who are doing a great work. Of course, the irregular lines, they are only a small percentage of people who are carrying out the message and the world church is the majority. So Lord, give us wisdom to make the right decisions and help us not to do anything that is offensive to you, to have wisdom and to have love for the mainstream churches because that's your church. And it's not, it should never be our desire that they should run out of money to do other work. Surely, Lord, there are so many other baptisms that take place in the churches. So help us to be wise and open our eyes. Help us to be led by you and you alone. But at the same time, help us not to neglect the work. And forgive us where we may have made the wrong decisions. Forgive us where we have not been of, of good influence in our mainstream churches. Give us wisdom of Christ. Give us the mind of Christ. That, Lord, we may do that which pleases you. Help us to avoid conflicts with the mainstream churches. Help us to be like Jesus to walk humbly before you. We ask that you give us wisdom, give us the strength to carry out the work that you've given us to do. May you grant us your, your blessings today, each and every person here and our families. Thank you for taking care of us and thank you for these wonderful, beautiful words of life that we can see scripture so clearly. Help us not to waste it, but to use it to bring glory to your holy name. Bless it, Sir Judith, for leading out. Bless our family and each and every one of us here. In Jesus' precious and holy name, we pray and thank you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sister Dorothy, for praying for us. And thank you for everyone who's come to attend this uh, reading. Um, I pray that tomorrow many more will come and will share all this important um, truth with each other. Bless everyone. I pray for a special blessing for everyone. I'll hand over to Brother Desire. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Judith. Uh, looking forward to picking up from where we live tomorrow morning and uh, wonderful discussions going on. May God bless you, brother. And I hope uh, everyone has a wonderful day. Just to remind you that um, the uh, December prayer retreat, uh, the booking is now open. Uh, please um, get in touch with Sister V if you need um, any special, uh, if you have special circumstances uh, and uh, you might need more time, uh, please do get in touch with Sister V. Uh, it's going to be, I believe, um, £150 for the six days we're going to be there from Wednesday to Tuesday, the 20th of December to the 26th of December. Uh, we have our international speakers they have all confirmed that they are coming. Let's keep them in our prayers. Let's also pray that um, more people come to this meeting to hear the word. And let's pray about um, this evangelism that we're talking about. We need to step up now. Time is short. And warn the multitudes that are in the valley of decision. Some are heading into Christless graves. May God help us. Have a wonderful day, brethren. In the evening, we have, uh, in the afternoon, we have uh, midday prayers from 12 to 1. 
And then in the evening, we have Brother Ezra. Uh, he's got some powerful messages uh, sharing. He's, he was sharing last night. Uh, so please invite others and uh, join in the evening. Amen.